Hello sophomores, this is Father Manco, and we're going to be talking about the difference between mortal and venial sin. Before we can do that, we should probably start talking about evil in general. So here's the thing, in the Christian tradition, and actually going back to the Greeks even before that, evil is not something, like you can't go to the store and get a pound of evil. Evil is a privation. In a way, it's nothing. It's that something's missing. So Thomas Aquinas will talk about different kinds of privation. So things are not ordered correctly. So children bossing around their parents. Um, you know, you could have uh, students bossing around the deans. So that's not the proper order of things. It might also be that things are missing due measure. So someone talks out in class, and instead of getting an extra assignment or even a jug, the teacher beats a student unconscious within an inch of their life. That's not due measure. That's a bit too harsh of a punishment for the offense committed. And a defect of form, which would, is where something is supposed to have a certain uh, kind of design to it or shape, and something goes wrong. So a person who's uh, born blind, there's something in their biological system that isn't working as it should. And because there's a should there, we can talk about a privation. Something, something is missing. That's why blindness is an evil. Now, there are different kinds of privations. Uh, so here's different kind of examples. So when a body is uh, deprived of health, it's sick. When a person is deprived of wealth, they are living in poverty. When someone's deprived of sight, there's blindness. Uh, when we just don't have light in general, there's darkness. And when there's a privation of moral goodness in, act, in an act, then we have a sin. So a sin is, is uh, an act that is missing proper order, due measure, or form. Or some combination of those or all of the above. So there are different kind of evils that we can talk about. And you saw that from the examples above. There's physical and there's moral evils. So physical evils, uh, physical privations, are where we're going without something that is good for us. So we're going without health. And health is good for us. Um, and then there, there are also moral evils. So it's a lack of a type of goodness. So um, we might have lust, and so we lack a, a type of moderation. Uh, we might have avarice or greed, and so there, we lack a certain type of generosity. And we might have pride. You know, it's a certain lack of humility. But all these types of evils that we're listing here means there's really a lack of something that ought to be there. So here's uh, two definitions of sin from Augustine and Thomas Aquinas. A thought, word, or deed contrary to the eternal law, the eternal law being the will of God. And St. Thomas just says, eh, it's a morally bad act, in the shorthand version. All right, now this is absolutely crucial. You need to write this down. You need to memorize it. Tattoo it on your arm if necessary. Three characteristics of mortal sin. We're going to talk about each of them and what they mean. But all three must be present for a mortal sin to be committed. So here's the basic distinction between venial and mortal sin. Mortal sin is sin in the truest sense. It's the fullness of sin. A venial sin is, it, it, it's half formed or, you know, it's defective. There, there's something not all there about the sin. And so when you get to the effects, the venial sin can, can weaken a relationship, but only mortal sin can kill it. And it kills that supernatural charity or love, which is that bond of friendship with God. And so to commit a mortal sin means to kill that bond, to destroy it. Venial sin uh, only, only weakens it. And so that's the, that's the big difference. Um, so it's not like five venial sins add up to a mortal sin. No. There's no specific number of venial sins that add up to a mortal sin. Just like if you think of a husband and wife together, married for a long time, and uh, for the billionth time, the husband leaves the toilet seat up to the great annoyance of his wife. But here's the thing. Even if the husband you know, leaves the toilet seat up you know, a thousand times, this is not the stuff that divorce is made of. This is not the stuff that you know, absolutely ruins a relationship. Now, if the husband were a really good husband, he would listen to his wife and be concerned about her. And if, if she asks him to put the toilet seat down, he's going to be more conscious of that. 
but it doesn't destroy the relationship. Not the way something like adultery would affect the relationship. And that would be mortal sin territory, leaving the toilet seat up, venial sin territory. So that gives you kind of a, an intuitive sense of the difference between the two. Okay, so now let's pull, apart, let's pull apart those three characteristics that we talked about of mortal sin. First of all is grave matter. And I'll have some handouts for you in class about kind of more specific examples or lists of this sort of thing. And, but there are a couple basic principles. So for something to be grave matter, so remember we talked about matter and form, for something to be grave matter for sin, it has to be about something serious. And what makes something serious, you ask? Well, could be who is sinned against or what is done by the sin. Could be the relationship to the person offended. So uh, something like uh, you think of uh, telling a lie. So lots of kinds of lies out there. Some are, some are grave matter and some are not. Honey, does this dress make my butt look fat? No, dear, you look lovely, skinny as ever. Okay, little white lie, um, perhaps still not good and not truthful, but certainly not in the same category of something like perjury, where you raise your right hand and you swear to tell the truth. And what that means when you're swearing is that you're calling God as a witness. So if you're lying while you're on the witness stand, you're asking God to be a party to your lie. God who says, I am the truth. And yeah, that's no bueno. And that would fall into the grave matter category as opposed to the, the honey, no, that just uh, makes your butt look nice and small category sort of thing. So, uh, so to draw God in into a lie would be a grave matter because of who we're talking about in that situation. could also be the case of what is done by uh, the sin. So, um, you know, if uh, taking, taking a couple of fries from a friend at lunch, you know, in some sense it you know, could be considered stealing. You know, it might be a little joke that you play on someone. You know they don't want you to take the fries, but you take a few anyway. You know, what's the harm? Well, okay, they're missing a few fries. Um, but if you steal someone's car, you're talking about something much more serious there. And so that, that kind of stealing would be put into grave matter. Um, or you take someone's wallet or their phone. You know, those are valuable and important things. So that kind of stealing um, is different than, you know, something that's just a little joke. So that wouldn't be considered grave matter. There's also the question about the relationship to the person offended and who, um, you know, our relationship to someone can make the sin better or worse. Um, so you know, uh, we have special obligations to our friends, to our parents, um, to our particular teachers. This is why you punching your mother is worse than, you know, some random person punching your mother. Even if both cases are wrong, but it's worse because you're her son or daughter, and so it's especially bad for you to do it. Okay. Uh, now, the next thing that we need to talk about is full knowledge. So, knowing, knowing the action that we're uh, choosing. And this doesn't um, necessarily mean that um, we have to be explicitly told externally that something is wrong. So something like murder or adultery, there's something about our reason that even without help should be able to tell us or kind of give us some indication that this is not good. And we have to listen to that voice. It's called our conscience. So when you go against your conscience, what you're doing is clearly sinful. And so you have knowledge of the action that's being taken and also some indication that it's wrong. And so then we're talking, um, then we're talking about, in a sense, full knowledge. Now here's the thing, you might not, you can have full knowledge of what you're doing even if you don't think it's sinful. So Hitler killing, you know, millions and millions of people in death camps, Jews, gypsies, yada, yada, yada. He knew what he was doing. He had full knowledge that I send the people to the camps and then they get gassed and then we burn their bodies and, you know, that's how it goes. He, he absolutely knew what he was doing, even if his conscience didn't um, really bother him about that. But that still counts as full knowledge because he knows the action that he's taking. And here's the thing. 
if we have knowledge that we're told from some external source that something is wrong, that can increase its evil, which is why Christians under a, are under a greater obligation to do good than others, because we've heard the gospel. We know how God loves us. We know what He teaches. And therefore, it's more wrong for us to commit a sin than for other people, because we should know better, because we've been given the gift of faith, the gift of Scripture, and these things impose a greater obligation on us. Now, full knowledge, so one way to help understand that is looking at the things that diminish full knowledge. So let's say age, you know, you're too young, you know, a four-year-old just can't commit a mortal sin because they don't have proper knowledge. Also mental problems, dementia, schizophrenia, hallucinations, those sorts of things, Alzheimer's, can, can diminish our functioning to the extent that we don't really know what we're doing. Now, ignorance, this is, this is a one you've got to be careful with here. Um, you, do, you didn't know that something was wrong. Um, it might be invincible. So you didn't know, and you couldn't know. You couldn't defeat that ignorance. But if your ignorance is freely chosen or it's feigned, guess what? You ain't going to fool Jesus. You might be able to fool Father Manco, but you're not going to fool Jesus. He knows what's going on. So what do I mean by freely chosen ignorance? So let's say, you know, you say, okay, well, you know, I, gosh, you know, I have some ha habits, things I do. You know, I think they might be wrong, but gosh, you know what? I, I really don't want to know for sure because then I'll, I'll feel like I have to stop and I don't want to try. So you know what? I'm just going to sleep every day when I go to Father Manco's class and I'm not going to read the catechism or, or the scripture or anything like that because I don't want to know what I'm doing is wrong. I'm not going to ask anybody about it. That's freely chosen ignorance, and it's a sin. So not only are you responsible for the sins you're doing, you're responsible for trying to be ignorant of what you should be doing. Um, also, something like confusion would diminish uh, full knowledge. You know, so that could be from a, a variety of causes. Okay. The third and final characteristic for mortal sin is deliberate or complete consent. And so the will, the part of us that, that chooses, freely and completely chooses the action that's proposed by the intellect. So the intellect says, let's do X, and the will says, mm-hmm, okay. So what do we need for, well, what are things that can diminish consent? So sleepiness, when you're really sleepy, just about to go to bed, or, you know, waking up, I mean, you can tell, like, you're not really with it. For me, I'm not really with it till about noon, so I, I really don't think I can commit a mortal sin before noon, because I'm just not, I'm just not there. Uh, something like fear or coercion can sometimes diminish consent. Now, this doesn't mean that, oh, well, well, I felt the least bit of fear, therefore it's not, I, I didn't fully consent. Mm, no, that's not quite right either. Um, but the thing is, sometimes we can be so afraid you know, afraid out of our minds that, that we can't, we don't function properly. We don't make the choices that we normally would. And so that's why fear can, um, can sometimes uh, diminish the, the consent that, that we're giving. Here's some helpful questions for figuring out, you know, have I given, do I, did I have full consent? Could I have done otherwise? Could I have chosen not to do what I did? And if, in a sense, if there was no way that you could have done otherwise, well, then, then you might not actually be dealing with a mortal sin. When Thomas Aquinas looks at, at Peter denying who Jesus was, he asks, was that a mortal sin? And he says, yes. Because you know what? Even though Peter was kind of scared, he could have done otherwise. He could have told the truth. There's nothing that made him say, oh, psh, Jesus? Jesus who? I do not know this man. No, he knew. So those are the, that's the difference between uh, mortal and venial sin, that one is full sin, one is not really full sin. And, but they're both uh, a type of evil. That there's a, a, a deprivation of something. But mortal sin is where you have the full deprivation um, because we are fully engaged. There's full knowledge, full consent to the will, and it's about something serious. And so when you have all those three together, we're talking about a real big deficiency 
an immoral act so big that it can actually ruin our relationship with God. Okay, well, enough of that happy talk. See you later.